Right. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me uh, just talk to Bill Gates for a second, and it's Bill Gates I'm talking to, not the Apple crowd. Do, 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 do. That should do the job. Good. And, yeah, I mean, Dave, for quite a chunk of my career, Dave's been my supervisor, and uh, in fact, in that early movie he showed, uh, right at the beginning, he was the guy on the donkey and I was the guy looking through the, uh, <coughs> the theodolite, and then I'd make the tea. Um, so I've got used to, you know, I force a habit just doing whatever he tells me, and, and today's no exception. So there we go. Uh, <coughs> and we're supposed to be concentrating on land today, so I'll talk a few uh, minutes about progress in, in land seismic technology. And my, my flow this morning will be about, uh, talk about some of the generic issues uh, we have with land seismic. I'm going to go through that very quickly because most of us know what they are and some pictures have been shown already. And then I'd say a little a bit about how we would actually like to do our seismic on land. Uh, and then I'll say a bit about how we're actually doing it. Uh, and then I'll say, what, so what do we need to do to do it the way we would actually like to do it if we could? Right. So that's my flow. So I'll start with a few generic issues just for, just for amusement and entertainment, really. Um, <clears throat> but the main problem, of course, is cost. Because onshore, wells are cheap. Offshore, wells are expensive. And, uh, of course, uh, onshore seismic is expensive or V-expensive, and uh, offshore seismic is relatively cheap. So we're uncompetitive uh, with the drilling guys, uh, which is quite serious because they're tough nuts. So why is it so expensive? Well, we've got all these issues like terrain, masses of equipment, et cetera, et cetera, instrument limitations, source issues, people intensive and, and near surface issues and, and time lapse issues too, really. So um, that means that our land seismic uh, is compromised in terms of data quality because uh, we end up with poor ground sampling and actually we need much more ground sampling on land than we do in marine. Uh, and we end up with poor, just generally poor redundancy of cover, which is no good at all. So just a couple of words about terrain problems and just to illustrate uh, some of these issues, masses of equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Two seconds on that. So obviously, you know, it's a problem. Doing seismic places like that, places like that, places like that. Uh, and of course, a couple of slides there. You've seen similar things already this morning. Masses and masses of equipment to be pumped around uh, the countryside. Uh, seismic sources are always a, a difficult issue. Wherever you are, you've got to drill the dynamite in. Uh, and in mountainous areas uh, like that one up there, I mean, it's, it's tricky stuff. You've got a helicopter it around, and, uh, and the HSE is an issue, the number of staff is an issue. Uh, and even using vibrators, you, you, can have, you can end up with some pretty tricky uh, issues. So uh, it's, uh, it's always a problem. And of course, people intensive. Uh, as somebody mentioned, you've got hundreds and hundreds of people on, on a jungle crew, and, and certainly it certainly doesn't need me there. So, uh, near surface issues. Uh, I'm always amazed whenever I see some of these slides that are examples that Don Stevens at Kansas University puts out. I mean, these are geophones, for example, that are just you know just a, a meter, 1.2 meters apart. I mean, how can two traces so close together, two geophones so close together, be so different? And, and we're not even talking time lapse here; we're just talking spatial. Differences. So the, the near surface issues are, are horrendous on land. So where are we going? Well, <coughs> let's say we didn't have any of these problems, okay? How would we actually like to do our land seismic? So here we go. Well, uh, I'd like to do big, cheap, fast exploration 3D surveys on land because all these, a lot of these almost unexplored basins, you need to get the, the sweet spots, the, uh, what was the word you used, core, areas versus non-core areas, you've got to get these sorted out. <coughs> and then uh, once you've done that, of course, it's nice to have some detailed, high-quality 3D seismic uh, for reservoir architecture, get your reservoir uh, sorted out. Uh, and then, of course, you need some reservoir surveillance. So that's how I'd like to do it on land. And why do I put it that way around? Because historically, uh, in the marine areas, years and years ago, let's take West Shetlands. Um, in BP, we did an enormous, very cheap, very sparsely sampled 3D, covered a huge area in 1993. Oh, that found some sweet spots, core areas. Uh, it found several reservoirs, actually. Uh, and then, of course, uh, after that, uh, we go in and do uh, much more detailed surveys on individual reservoirs, et cetera, et cetera. And then gradually, we get into reservoir surveillance. And uh, that particular area 
the signs need to be recorded about every two years ever since, and they're still <coughs> and they're planning the next one right now. So that's why I say uh, we'd like to do big, wide area coverage, cheap, cheap, fast land 3D siding to start with. So are we actually doing it? Okay, uh, we're certainly not. We, we certainly haven't got it split into one, two, and three there, I'm afraid. What we tend to be doing <coughs> is linking up one and two because it is so time-consuming, difficult, and expensive to be there on land uh, that we're kind of trying to do a good quality job when we get there. And that's the way it's, that's the way it's ended up, and, and no surprises there. So uh, we've combined one and two, one and two in many cases, but it's good. It's, it's, driven, it's driven tremendous improvements in equipment and, and techniques. But... We hardly do number three at all. We hardly do any reservoir surveillance. It's just beginning, uh, but we hardly do any on land. But that'll come, as we shall see. Okay, so instrument limitations, they're, they're, they're fading away. Very nice. Uh, you've got this wonderful graph of, uh, of instrument channel count, uh, the number of years. That's when I started down there with my piss helmet on. Uh, and up we go here, and we're kind of uh, into huge numbers. And I've picked up several manufacturers there, and, and of course nowadays uh, most of the menu, major manufacturers can operate uh, in this region here. So um, channel count uh, is much less of an issue than it was, and it, that's been a really good success story over the last, say, 10 years or so. Most of these, are, well, the ones I've shown there are cable systems, uh, and these high channel count cable systems are driving really good quality improvements, and I'll show you an example in a second, but they're really, really good. Right. Uh, there's also a move, as, as John said, towards uh, cable-free node or, or wireless systems, I haven't differentiated here, uh, allowing almost unlimited channel capacity. Talking about um, theft of these systems, I remember, do I not, John, that the first time you demonstrated these, uh, that system of yours to me, uh, it was done very close to a prison uh, in Lincolnshire. Uh, in fact, it was in their market garden, I think, or their, their vegetable garden and the stuff had been laid out overnight, uh, and in the morning, by the time the morning came, all the trustees had walked off with most of the batteries. So uh, the theft is, uh, is certainly an issue, and, uh, and in fact, not just cables, but also cable systems. I remember in the UK, we had a complete Cell system removed overnight once, and it ended up back in a, in a non-ferrous uh, scrapyard <laughs> without the electronics. So these things happen. Anyway. Uh, Conventional seismic, and most of the seismic is still shot that way. We, uh, you know, we attenuate the ground roll with these uh, uh, individual geophones close together if we can. Uh, but of course, the recorders had, or still have, a bit limited capacity, so we join them all together in, in groups, and there we go. So we hardwired summation of detectors uh, done in the field, and of course that results in a lot of noise events that are insufficiently uh, attenuated, and, and they're, well, they're alias through the, the coarse sampling. Uh, and, and these near-surface variations that we can see, uh, they're, they're kind of smear, they smear our time and, uh, and uh, reduce our data quality. And little variations in coupling, I mean, between individual GFNs, they're, they're, they're irretrievably hardwired into the system. And, of course, immediately the advantage of these single sensor systems, uh, goodness, it's great, because uh, that simple uh, noise attenuation filters that the, the hardwired version uh, used to impart to us, we can improve on with uh, using sort of neat little weighting function, and we can even make it data adaptive, uh, like the Western Geco Q system started to do, and, and very nice too. It's very nice to see these things happening. So, um, and features such as uh, time statics like this, which are topographically or near surface related, can be estimated, corrected for, and, and these have been wonderful advances, actually, wonderful for the last 10 years or so. Very good. And perturbations like sensor. Variations, soil coupling, and because these are pretty big, if you read some of the papers, uh, they're they're large, and you can remove these. So you can make it work in two dimensions to remove uh, noise waves coming in, in uh, different angles, uh, and it's really made huge strides. And just to give you one example of that, uh, there's a uh, single sensor data line changing into a well, a conventional system here, uh, changing into a single sensor system there, and you can see the improvement in resolution, signal to noise, and everything else. So it's, it really is working. So thanks to the guys who are producing these systems, whether they're cable or cable-less, they're very good. Right, and of course for cable-less, there's uh, lots of activity in the marketplace. Uh, there's at least six, and, and, and I know several more, uh, that are coming through uh, <coughs> producing these land nodes or, or wireless systems. Uh, brilliant, really good. 
um, but of course you need a lot of them. And uh, so let's report on some of the experience that uh, I've heard of or read in the literature uh, about some of these uh, land nodal or wireless uh, systems. Well, the bottom line is they work, or the top line in this case, they work. Uh, they, uh, in some cases, they actually are the preferred uh, technology. Batteries, of course, are uh, massively problematic with these systems. You can end up actually with a cableless system which weighs more uh, than a cable system uh, because of these batteries. So it is a problem. Uh, they greatly increase the weight. The, the charging logistics are an issue in some of the early systems. It became a big issue. Uh, typically, you'll see reported uh, 20 days autonomy, typically, as uh, and John mentioned, the same sort of figure, uh, and that uses something like an 18 ampere hour battery. Now, uh, I, I got a little workshop at home, and I play with electronics, and, and just to keep myself my hand in here, and I can get a little system like this, and uh, that's the antenna, and this little gizmo weighs three grams. I weighed it this morning at 1 a.m., right? Uh, the, um, it cost about 20 pounds. By the time I put a little case around it, it be uh, 22 pounds or something. Uh, and uh, I can connect a few geophones, a couple of geophones to it in my back garden and uh, a little antenna on the top, and it'll transmit into my, my little uh, study. So, um, <coughs> but the trouble is, uh, to get 20 days autonomy, just like John said, uh, even on something like as simple as this and lightweight as this, I need about a 6.2 kilogram uh, 18 amp hour battery. <coughs> so 6.2 kilograms with a 3 gram <coughs> bit of kit is not on really. Uh, it's, uh, it's a much more serious problem uh, than, uh, than, it, than it should be. So really, hopefully, the, the current consumption of these needs to come down by order of magnitude or two, uh, and uh, that will reduce the battery uh, weight by, uh, not, not by the same amount, but by a significant amount. Um, this will do, yeah, this will do a couple of channels. Um, this digitizes at pretty high speed, so I could reduce the speed, or I, I could reduce the, the fidelity a little bit. Uh, I could reduce the, the need to transmit. This is a transmitter. Uh, I don't need to do that. So um, that's what, I think that's what we need to do. So how do we need to make that, how do we make that work uh, to get my, my one, two, and three, my big, fast, uh, cheap surveys, and, and, and eventually my, uh, my reservoir uh, monitoring. Okay, well, if you look at the, um, the, <coughs> look at the, best, uh, the best advice from, uh, uh, from the universities, et cetera, one of the best departments there would be the Cruz uh, Department at uh, Calgary University. Um, they, they investigate these things, and they say, well, let's have about a two-meter closely spaced uh, single sensor system, well, you work out how many million of these you would need uh, to cover a, you know, 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer survey. And, and it's, uh, it's not on, really, uh, to do that with uh, either, not either with a cable system or a cable system. Uh, so to get my number one big, cheap, fast uh, surveys, this is not the way to do it. Uh, what's the way to do it? Well, actually, if you look at what BP have been doing the last few years on the source side, uh, we've got all these vibrosized <coughs> units, to, up to, to 20 of them, all running uh, simultaneously and independently, sweeping independently, and the electronics and the processing uh, <coughs> keeping track of all that. Uh, and that's actually improved the, the, the source productivity by order of magnitude, very close to an order of magnitude. Uh, but it's placed enormous strain on moving around the kit, the recorder, the uh, sensing and recording kit. Uh, so. Uh, to give you an idea how BP have attacked that, I would suggest you go to a paper at the uh, EAGE coming up in June in London uh, called High Productivity Cableless Acquisition in Libya with the ISSN technique. So they're doing this with, the, uh, with a very fast high production source coupled with a, uh, a very uh, fast, uh, cheap way of deploying nodes. That's what the N stands for. Uh, and ending up with, with my number one, which is a very big, uh, very cheap uh, 3D survey uh, for exploration purposes. So there's, there's my number one. If we can make that work uh, in, uh, in, in all terrains, that would be really good. So there's that one. Uh, how do we do two and three is my problem. Well, uh, I would tend probably to link these together uh, because uh, I think the trend now, well, Let's, because 
Reservoir surveillance, so we're into time lapse, we're into repeat surveys. And if I look at uh, some of the wisdom available on repeat surveys, well, it, it doesn't look very encouraging to start with. Uh, this is the current CGD Veritas land brochure on their website. I looked at it this morning, 1 a.m. Uh, and um, it's, not, uh, it's not what you call encouraging, but the same company has produced uh, a system like this one uh, where you have uh, sources and uh, detectors which are actually uh, buried under, under, the, uh, under the ground below the, the, that troublesome near-surface layer, and they call it size movie. Uh, and it will get rid of a lot of these weather effects and population effects and so on. Uh, and it's actually brilliant. Uh, if you, uh, they've done some tests where the source is initially on the surface and then later uh, in the near surface, I mean only a few metres underground, and if it's on the surface, uh, they can detect uh, variations, uh, even the diurnal temperature variations, uh, morning to evening uh, here, and then a big rainfall and bloop, down it goes. So that's the trouble with the surface. Uh, when you put uh, the source into the near surface, below that weathered layer, you get this sort of thing. And uh, the, the scale here, I mean, you're looking at, a, uh, at a, uh, an accuracy of a, of a few tens of microseconds instead of the odd millisecond or two. And if you look at, the, uh, at the, some of the research they've done, uh, again, a lot of this in Canada, uh, to see uh, how, how repeatable can seismic be, uh, and buried and buried gives you about six microseconds on time, and about a half a percent on amplitude variations. Brilliant. So actually, that's the way to go for quality uh, reservoir surveillance. So uh, they call it size movie. And why do they call it size movie? Well, I'm going to show you a movie. Uh, thanks to, uh, uh, again, uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the initiatives in, in Canada for the, uh, again, fairly shallow, uh, the shallow reservoirs on the uh, heavy oil reservoirs in Canada. So. Okay, nothing much is happening here because they haven't actually started. But here we go. They started to uh, inject steam up there and they started to uh, uh, produce oil down in the south there. So injection at the north, production in the south. And uh, it, you can see the noise level there, but it's, uh, it's not very high. Maybe better to show you that as a, as a, on, on a weekly, as sort of a weekly movie. So there's, uh, and nothing's happening here, and then suddenly they start injecting. So here's the injection in the north and here's the production effects in the south. And this thing runs all the time. Uh, the sources are buried. The detectors are buried. Uh, they're low-power sources, but they run all the time, so the energy isn't necessarily low, uh, and it's just brilliant. So there's a, a couple of pictures. They're producing. They're, they're, they're pulling these things into about 12 meters deep, and uh, in, in pretty pretty difficult terrain as well. So thanks to uh, Shell, who were, who run the crew, and CGD Veritas, who produced the size movie. It's uh, pretty effective. So. Uh, up till now, uh, this uh, technique has been used um, only on the uh, on shallow reservoirs, typically the, uh, the heavy oil in Canada or gas storage uh, in Europe. Uh, there's no crew. There's no seismic crew at all. Once you put the kit in, there's no disruption. There's no environmental effects uh, once it's in there. You can do micro-seismic monitoring with it, look for fractures, listen for fractures, etc. Uh, you can avoid the weathered layer. Uh, and there's automated processing, so you, you, know, you hardly even need a processor after, it, after it's all set up. <coughs> Apologies to the processors. Um, <coughs> now, so what this needs, really, for us, for our purposes, uh, is to scale it up for conventional reservoirs two to 3,000 meters deep. Uh, and that hasn't yet been done to my knowledge, but it's something I think uh, we should do. So, anything else to kind of assist or complement the seismic? Well, the answer is yes. We've heard a lot about gravity today. Uh, and actually, uh, here's a little picture from uh, the Arctic, from uh, Prudhoe Bay, uh, where they've done uh, gravity surveys in 2005, 2006, 2007, displayed them in a time-lapse sense, and compared the, uh, you can certainly see the changes, and compared these uh, with, the, with actual seismic and, and knowledge of the reservoir, uh, and actually you can track uh, the water flood uh, with uh, time-lapse gravity. Um, and Gravimeters, uh, they're progressing. In fact, uh, Statoil has worked with Scripps to produce a uh, more sensitive one, and they're being, they're being deposited on the seabed in, in offshore reservoirs in, the, in Norway. <coughs> Other things are tempting, not done much, but uh, I mean, resistivity is very tempting. The physics is tempting because uh, you change from uh, uh, oil filled to water filled, uh, the resistivity goes to an order of magnitude or more, whereas our seismic change. Uh, Acoustic velocity and impedance only changes, uh, you know, five or six percent if we're lucky. So, 
uh, there are some interesting things that could be done there. And uh, well, there's uh, other things you could do. Um, you can look at uh, maybe look at ground. Uh, ooh, Bill Goats, come on, Bill. Uh, you can look at uh, the deformation of the ground. Here's an example from the Groningen gas field in northern Holland. Uh, use of uh, satellite-based uh, GPS uh, uh, height measuring systems, and you can watch the simulation of how the uh, the, the surface uh, deformation varies during the life of the uh, the, uh, the gas reservoir in uh, in Groningen. And there it goes. And okay, I mean the scale may only be 10 centimeters, 90 millimeters there. Uh, but if you're in a country like, like Holland, where uh, a lot of the place is underwater anyway, that's uh, quite a worrying uh, situation. <coughs> so, uh, and of course, uh, if you've been reading the papers, the geophysical papers of the last five years, you'll have noticed a huge increase in, in, in sort of geomechanics issues. So, in fact, our time-lapse seismic is beginning to allow us to detect the changes in time due to the, uh, the, the compaction and decompression of, of the rock as, as the reservoir depletes. And uh, papers by well, Keith Hawkins, uh, Paul Hatchell, Rochelle, uh, have shown us how to maybe translate this into, into, uh, uh, into interpreting um, the, uh, the reservoir for undrained compartments, etc. So there's exciting things happening out there. Uh, the driving forces for this, actually, reservoir surveillance, high quality seismic, uh, is, is things like the recovery factor. Uh, if you look plot recovery factors, the average recovery factor of an oil reservoir is, I mean, it's 30 odd percent, and that's an optimistic number. Uh, even the best reservoirs tend to be in places like Norway, and there's only two or three of them that are really good, heading towards maybe 60 percent or more. Uh, the worldwide average is really lousy. That's optimistic. In fact, the other, Sandrea, who's uh, the most, most famous reservoir engineer on the planet, uh, says that the, uh, the average recovery factor is about 22 percent. So you guys, there's lots of incentive there uh, to get your seismic quality up uh, and do this uh, reservoir surveillance. Uh, because once the newspapers get hold of the, uh, of the fact that uh, we're leaving 60, 70, 80 percent of, of our oil in the ground, and it turns out that we're getting short of oil, if it happens, if, 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 if oil supply peaks, uh, then uh, you're going to have uh, newspapers asking you, are you leaving how much oil in the ground? It's going to be a little embarrassing for, especially the reservoir engineers like Sandra, but, but for us as well, because <laughs> we're, uh, we're explorers. Okay, and the, the potential there is enormous because uh, uh, we've got tremendous potential to improve the performance of the drilling on land, because the number of land, si uh, land drilling rigs operating compared to offshore drilling rig operating, I mean, it's orders of magnitude. So the potential there is absolutely huge. So really, in conclusion, uh, that's the way we want to do it. Uh, one, two, and three will probably have to link two and three together. Uh, these cableless systems have their, certainly have their place in there. Uh, you go and see that ISSN paper at the EAG to figure out how to do number one. Uh, so there's great potential there to, to realize these aims. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Well, you were lucky then. <laughs> yeah. And do I get to keep this, or you, do you want to take Ooh, it? Oh, I want that back. Yeah. It's 20 pounds. Okay, okay don't run off. So we're going to do two things. Just take any specific questions for Ian, and then we'll have a slightly attenuated, um, to use a seismic term, um, panel discussion, um, where I'll ask the, uh, the speakers to come up here. In fact, Ivan, David, where's David? If you could come up as well, and John. If you could take your seats and let Ian just field any questions that there are, and then we'll we will move on. And uh, if not, let's yes, please over there, Sean. Yes, yeah, yeah, you need to stand. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't possibly say anything about the nice advert for size movie, but um, going away from the trying to get over the logistic problems of the big, fast, cheap exploration surveys. Can you see any reason why it still seems that life of field type systems and something like size movie for onshore perhaps hasn't really taken off as fast as it might have done? You, you say that recovery factors are not terribly encouraging, but there seems to be a reluctance to, to go into that kind of area as much as you might do. 
We are a very conservative industry. It takes years and years and years to get this stuff going. I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, uh, let, let me add something to that. I, 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 I've done an experiment several times uh, with phones. Um, it used to be a BlackBerry, yeah, but nobody owns Blackberries anymore, do they? Um, so I now do it with iPhones. And, and you know, I've done this with a thousand people in the room and said, okay, who of you does not own one of these? And by and large, two people out of several hundred put their hands up. If you look at all the evidence, so as people, we're very, we, we take on technology quickly. If you look at all the evidence about our industry, and, and Shell commissioned a big study by McKinsey um, probably 10 years ago now, we are way behind every other industry in adopting new technology, whether it's uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, iron and steel, for God's sake. Medicine. Uh, medicine. You know, any of these things, we're way behind. And the typical time from first, first idea to... 50% market penetration are two or three times as long in, in our industry. So if you look at 3D seismic, there's a good question. When was the first 3D seismic survey shot? The answer is 1967 or something like that. 74. When, when did it yeah. get up to 50% market penetration? 80, 89. Yeah. So, you know, 20, 20 odd years. If you look at horizontal drilling, you know, which is sort of all the rage. When was the first ever horizontal <coughs> well drilled? Uh, I mean, I normally do it by, let's have a show of hands, who thinks it was 1970, who thinks it was. The answer is 1947. It took 60 years before half of the whole length in the world was horizontal or whatever the percentage is today. 4D seismic, 1983 to 2003, so, so, so we have a reputation well earned, which we would all deny personally, that, uh, but we have a reputation and a reality of an extremely, extremely conservative in industry compared with anything else you care to mention on the planet, actually. That's the, longest, that's the longest answer Sean's ever had to. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but of course the profound question is why this conservatism? Mm -hmm. yeah? well, especially in the light of <coughs> If there's ever been a cost-effective opportunity and where, somewhere where you can actually demonstrate really bang for buck, that's it. But still, it's, uh, it's well, yeah, we can do without that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Let's just drive on and see how we go. Yeah. Uh, and the, the Ameri well-known American gentleman summarised it for me a while ago. He said there's an old phrase which says, if you build a new mousetrap, people will beat a past your door. And his was, comma, except in the oil and gas industry, where they will beat you up. <laughs> Which, you know, and it, 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 it's sort of amusing, but, you, you know, why is it, is, is the question. You know. Yeah, please, uh, over there.